We're going to kick off this first session. Uh, we're very, very fortunate. We're going to be joined by Lord Hall, the Director General of the BBC, um, who's, going, who's agreed to um, uh, have a fireside chat and get into some of the issues. So please welcome to the stage the Director General of the BBC, Tony Hall. Hi. Tony, we'll, perhaps we'll kind of pull back, we'll get into some of the remarks that you know, uh, we've just been hearing about in a moment, but let's just sort of pull back, because um, over the next weeks and months, it gives you the opportunity to reflect on an extraordinary uh, career in public service broadcasting. You joined the BBC as a news trainee in 1973. Uh, by 1996, you were the chief executive of BBC News. You set up the, uh, the news channel. Um, you then uh, segued uh, towards uh, the Royal Opera House and, and Channel 4 for a decade and came back at a very challenging time uh, in 2013 since when you've been leading the organization. So um, picking up on this whole notion of kind of leading the culture of such an important public institution, what are your main reflections as to the culture of the BBC that you joined uh, as a young news trainee uh, the BBC you, you left in the middle of your career, the, the one you came back to and the one you're leaving in a few months' time? Um, I, I think uh, the culture when I joined, uh, very, very, very different. Uh, male, uh, smoky, I mean, cigarettes everywhere. Um, uh, if you wanted it, booze in all sorts of uh, places uh, as well. Uh, highly, highly competitive internally. I remember one occasion uh, when I was um, on uh, World at One, uh, keeping the, what turned out to be the lead story of the day away from the newsroom, which was about five or six metres uh, down, uh, down the corridor. Um, very internalised. Uh, and in fact, on my first day, I was asked to uh, sign that I'd read the Official Secrets Act and what kind of pension uh, scheme would I, would I join? And not a lot about the journalism uh, that day. So culture now, very, very different. Um, uh, technology, obviously different. There was a, a strange skill you had in television at that point, um, which was to uh, write today's story with pictures that had been gathered a day or sometimes two days before, because it came in as film and then had to go through processing. And so it was com mostly out of date, really. But you're, you know, your, your job was to make it feel uh, fresh and exciting uh, to w what we have today. And of course, the competition then was you were obsessively looking at ITN to find out, one flicking back and forth to find out how they got this, how they got that, and all that. So you know, in terms of technology and competition, completely different. But I think the thing which um, it runs through all of this uh, and is similar uh, are the values. And I think. Uh, you know, the BBC has constantly uh, reformed itself from those days of kind of almost steam radio and television through uh, when I was leading news, when we brought in uh, News 24, as it was then called, uh, BBC News Online, which everybody said wouldn't work, uh, through Five Live, uh, and, you know, what turned out to be a slow burner but ended up as a big hit, BBC Parliament, you know, that really came into its own last year. Uh, all, of that, all of that, reform, 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 but keeping your values the same. And the thing I, I remember most vividly, I think, from the 70s was uh, uh, my, my first uh, time working in, uh, in Belfast, when you realised when you went out uh, into the streets, if you brought a camera out, things would happen. Hmm. Uh, you know, you could be the generator of events that you didn't want to be a part of. And you also realised how accurate information, uh, information you can trust, was fundamental, because if things were put out as rumour or whatever, people could die or be bombed or whatever. So, and also, actually, in terms of bombing, actually respect for, for people uh, who had been killed or had been injured, uh, you know, that as journalists you should show that respect. So I think those kind of values run through uh, what the BBC is, uh, is now and those things we should cherish. But the BBC, ha and I appreciate what the Secretary of State would just say now, because I, I, I really believe it. I was writing about it yesterday in the Daily Mail. 
the BBC has to continually reform. And when you think about it, we have. That's what we've done. I mean, we've, we, we, we've gone from, you know, wireless to radio to television to colour to uh, uh, the, 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 the multi-channel revolution in the kind of 80s and 90s through to developing the iPlayer, through to setting up studios, through to doing BBC sounds and all of that. And I think this constant reform, constant reform is what the BBC is about, but to values that are constant. Thank you. Um, the Secretary of State talked quite a lot about uh, the current reviews that are undertaken. Were you a little surprised about the, the volume of activity given the fact that none of that was in the Conservative manifesto in the last election? Well, not, not surprised um, uh, because, you know, after elections there are all, there's always, you know, in my experience, a time when people are sorting out what they actually think. I thought that tone that the Secretary of State uh, uh, was taking uh, today was, uh, was absolutely right. Um, you, you, you need, you know, we've got an ecology in this country of public service broadcasting, which is the basis of something very, very precious and growing. Interesting to hear him say that the DCMS actually is a, is a department that's not the department of fun, although as he said, you know, it, it is, what they do is, is, is great fun, but actually is an economic department. I think that's a fundamentally different way of looking at the creative industries to say 20 years ago. At the heart of that is public service broadcasting, not just the BBC, but what ITV does, what Channel 4, which is also very precious, does, and integral to all of that is, uh, is the BBC. So for us to keep on arguing about what our role is, uh, I think is important. My own belief, and I go around all over the place saying this both abroad and also in this country, is there is more of a need for a BBC today than at any point in our history. Why? It is the best antidote to fake news. Why? It is the best way in which we can find new talent, bring that talent to our screens, to other people's screens, and then they can fly as, say, Phoebe Waller-Bridge has and go and make uh, a great career uh, globally. Also, the way in which regions and nations can talk to uh, uh, themselves. I, I was so struck. I mean, the case for public service broadcasters, when you look at the recent floods, for example, in Hereford and Worcester, a reporter had her flat underwater but was broadcasting, despite all that, for 16 hours because she believed in getting the information out to people uh, uh, who, who, uh, uh, who were important and who she cared about. All of these things, to my mind, says, uh, as the Secretary of State was saying, don't throw babies out with bath. I do hate that analogy, but there we are, I've used it. You know, actually, actually, what really matters is preserving the things that are valuable, the values that matter, the, the instincts, the, the things that public service broadcasting do, but adapt that to a very, very different world. And I think we're doing that, and, you know, reform uh, is going to be continuous. Y yesterday, um, Voice of the Viewer and Listener issued a paper uh, stating that in real terms since 2010, the funding of the BBC has gone down by 30%. There seems to be an inconsistency between all of the goodwill towards the, the central proposition of the value of the BBC and what's actually happening in terms of the political decision making over the last decade. Could you talk us through, in a sense, the funding settlement you inherited, mm. the kind of challenges you were facing on mm. funding at the time, and what subsequently you've, you've had to uh, anticipate and indeed, um, whether or not during your tenure, this perennial issue of the actual license fee model and, and how it might adapt for the future of, of a streaming uh, universe, uh, what, what situation that leaves for the person who will succeed you. Yeah, so, so uh, let me just outline. From 2010 to 2017, um, the BBC lost uh, a quarter of its income uh, against what they would have had had uh, the license fee gone up in line with inflation. And uh, that was just because it, there was no inflation license fee. It was also because the BBC took on responsibility for the World Service, £250 million uh, pounds or so, took on uh, responsibility for payments for S4C, uh, took on all sorts of other um, costs as well. And uh, I think that often gets forgotten because, yes, at that point, they saw off um, the over 75s, but at the same time, they took what is amounted to uh, a cut of 25% of what we would... Now, that's why um, the BBC put in a great efficiency programme, but that's why now uh, budgets are squeaking. Uh, under the then Secretary of State, when we uh, um, uh, renegotiated the Charter in uh, 2015 for 2017, two big things happened. Um, one... Uh, we had a charter through for 11 years, and I think that was brilliant, 
because actually that gives certainty and security to the BBC for all that time, and I think you know, that's a, a, a big deal. And the second thing that happened, although we took on the over 75s, we also had a license which was going up with, uh, in, with inflation. The net result of that is that we've kept track of uh, inflation uh, since then, but we're 25% down on where we were in 2010. But could it, if you could have your time again, could, could there have been more effort put into the reform of the license fee mechanism itself whilst all these other things were going on in order that the next five to ten years is a clearer map as to how that would need to evolve. Because it's see, what I think I'm hearing from the government is what's the model? Now you could have a debate about whether or not the streaming model as we understand it in, from the commercial sector is the model or whether something that works in a connected home is the model for public service broadcasting. But that seems to me to be the central question that now yeah. So it would need to be answered. So I think you've got basically between now and 2027 to kind of work some of these things out, and I think it's important that we do. I think the questions to my mind are the following. Can you learn from the streamers, even though, let me just emphasize this point, because people say, you know, things like, um, well, you know, what's the point of the BBC when you've got the streamers? You know, the BBC is not Netflix. It really isn't. It is something that is in the absolute fabric of this nature in terms of what it offers. Netflix don't do sport, they don't do news, they don't do a whole raft of things. So I think you know, it's really important, as the Secretary of State said, you know, that, that you see what the BBC delivers uh, in the round. Nonetheless, can you learn from the streamers uh, in terms of easy payments uh, for, uh, to make the licence fee feel like an, uh, a, a much, much easier to pay? Can you uh, look at those sort of things and learn what you can? And I think, I, I think uh, on, on, on top of that, um, is there a way of uh, boosting the mixed funding model which the BBC is? So the licence fee, uh, I think, beyond 2027 will still matter uh, and will still be phenomenally important to the BBC. Uh, in my time, I've set up BBC Studios. Why have I done that? Because actually I believe that our programme-making teams should be able to go and compete in the market for, uh, for productions and things that they want to do. We're actually taking on another 150 people in Bristol because our natural history uh, programmes there are doing so well. Can we do more uh, things like that? Um, uh, we've got another model for the uh, World Service where I uh, won from the then Chancellor George Osborne with the then Secretary of State's backing for more money to come into World Service. 85 million uh, uh, pounds a year. What has that done? 70% increase in audiences uh, in India, uh, huge growth of new services in Sub-Saharan Africa. All these things are fantastically important, I think, uh, for uh, global Britain and for the Britain who, which is outside the EU. We need to build that and I hope uh, this government will look favourably on plans which I've been hatching for some time with the previous governments to put even more money into what we do globally. I think this is the time is right. So there's also a kind of um, uh, can we use ODA funding and so on to fund more of what the BBC does well there. And then uh, with John Whittingdale we set up a really good um, partnership with the lo another example of funding which is the local uh, 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 democracy reporters. And this is us saying we'll put money, license fee money, into a scheme which allows 150 journalists uh, to work not just for us, to our values, but actually to work for local newspapers. It's been phenomenally successful. And I'm now uh, uh, set that up as a foundation. We're looking for people to come and fund that, to come and join us so we can expand what we do to increase uh, local democracy. Now, are there other areas in which the BBC could do that in areas of education? We set up a, um, a scheme when I came uh, back to the BBC for microbit. This is, went out into schools to teach coding to, to kids. That was funded by, I think, about 30 to 32 different companies coming together with us, with our kind of leadership, to make something happen. So you fundamentally need a license fee, in my view, uh, for uh, the free-to-air services, because there are areas which are very hard, as John Whittingdale has pointed out in various places, to turn off. We all know that. You know, radio. I mean, are you really going to put a barrier between radio and people? Uh, uh, I, I think uh, free-to-air television likewise matters. But I think that these other things that need to be built on as well. So in terms of future relevance, young audience is clearly a challenge for terrestrial broadcasters generally. Um, looking back on it, do you think uh, taking BBC Three off linear was the correct decision? Um, I, I think it was a, it was a, you know, uh, in W1A speak a brave decision, um, and uh, uh, it seemed uh, absolutely uh, right at the time. Uh, I'm looking at that and what we can learn from that. What we learned from it was people forget. Uh, one is uh, that we we moved the cash we saved into drama. Uh, I felt that the uh, budgets I was inheriting for drama weren't right. 
I think the various teams now, and it was Piers Wenger, have more than justified that in extra spending in drama. Our drama is on fantastic shape. We're doing great things. So, you know, that was the right call in having to make difficult decisions. I think what's been interesting about the repositioning of, of BBC Three is that you had a BBC Three in Old Speak, uh, when it was a linear channel, where most of the audience were for Family Guy, nothing wrong with that, and EastEnders. What uh, the last two controllers, including this one, have, have done of BBC Three is to make it something which amazingly has won, and wonderfully has won, Channel of the Year twice, because the quality of the output that they are producing, now wholly focused on uh, 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 that younger audience has been uh, utterly, utterly brilliant. And I think the creative things that they are doing is, 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 to, is, is terrific. And when we announce our annual plan, which we have to do uh, each year at the end of this month, I'll have something to say about BBC Three and its future then. So picking up on Secretary of State's remarks, um, he made some pretty clear uh, views known around impartiality. Uh, and representing the voices of the country, particularly over the last couple of years. Did you, do you agree with uh, his assessment? Well, I think so, two things. First, um, impartiality. Nothing matters more than journalism that you can trust. And, um, you know, the BBC is still, by a country mile, uh, the most trusted news source in the UK. More than that, it's a trusted news source uh, globally. Uh, and, so those, and, and those statistics I want, and he was I referring to... to the, 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 you, if you, you look at trust, if you look at trust, uh, we're the most trusted news source. But the point I want to say is, um, we should never shelter behind a well. If everyone's having a go at us, we must be doing something right. That's not right. Uh, I, uh, I want, and I believe we have uh, in the BBC uh, a very uh, self-critical news culture, one where we argue, and they do argue, uh, and toss around uh, ideas. Uh, and judgments about whether we've got things right or wrong. And one of the things I've said, if we get something wrong, we should say so and get it over with quickly. So I think uh, 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 we should always listen to what people are saying to us about uh, our our, in our impartiality. Uh, are we getting things right? We should be open to, to people uh, criticizing what we do. Uh, and of course, it's going to change uh, over time uh, because we are now in a more disputatious environment uh, than we have been uh, before. I think the Secretary of State something, said something interesting, which I've believed for some time, uh, and that is uh, about diversity of thought. Uh, right the way back to the beginning, when you reminded me how long I've been around, uh, uh, thank you. Um, I uh, remember the, the, the belief, I have a profound belief in teams. If you go and talk to the Natural History Unit, David is, is, David Adam is always very good about this. You know, he's modest, he says, well, of course, it's the team. He is right, that it's, I mean, in David's sense, it is him, but it's also teams matter. And in news, teams matter. In whatever you do, kind of, teams matter. And I think the diversity of teams matters. Therefore, having people who are going to argue with you, people who will come with a different perspective, a different view. Uh, I, I talked to our top 120 uh, 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 leaders um, recently about this. We had a very, very good debate about this. Finding, this is why I think diversity matters. It really matters to have people who don't think like you, who bring different perspectives to you in the judgments you make about news, but about programmes and about the content in general. Great. We're going to have time for a couple of questions with the floor. We've got a few minutes left. Um, obviously, it's a, a period to look back now over your extraordinary career. I've not, I'm, I'm not stopped yet. I'm still in, I'm public, still service, yeah, right, in yeah. public service broadcasting. Um, and it clearly has required an immense amount of personal commitment um, to come back to the BBC at a very difficult time uh, to steady the ship in the brilliant way that you did. So as you're now sort of contemplating the sort of um, uh, notes that you might leave to your successor and the characteristics that you think will be necessary in this job in the future, uh, what would be the, the two or three thoughts you, you'd leave? And then we'll go to the floor. I think for, okay, right. Um, uh, I think first, uh, we're a business, but we're a creative business. And I think uh, remembering that whatever we do has an impact on our culture is vital. I think remembering that, uh, you know, when I was at the Opera House, you're as good as your last show. Remember, you know, it's the programs that matter. I think organizations are brilliant at forgetting why they're there uh, and putting enormous amounts of effort into things that in the end may make a marginal uh, improvement on what they're doing. And one of the things I've, I've, I've loved and I shall miss, of course, when I eventually leave, um, is uh, meeting the programme makers, going out there with the teams. I've been around almost every local radio station. I go out there on sets of things that we're doing. I like finding out what we do, because in the end, we're a creative business and encouraging as, uh, 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 the creativity and, 
and difficult decisions and saying, go on, we'll back you on that. I mean, you know, uh, when we saw the Philip Pullman, uh, what will be a Philip Pullman uh, trilogy, Dark Materials, that was a hard decision. We were putting a lot of money into that. We felt it was a, a British story that should be told. The, the Hollywood had failed. You know, they did one... Uh, film and then gave up on it, and we thought, no, this is a major British art artist, uh, uh, author in Philip Pullman, and we want to get uh, the, the team behind this to make it work. And you know, I had a minor role in encouraging people to do it. Uh, the teams have delivered uh, on our first uh, set of programmes, and I think that is an important role of the director general. In other words, it's you know, whoever it is, it's an editorial, creative role as much as it is yeah. a business, a policy, and uh, and all the other stuff that you and I know about role. Brilliant. Um, hands going up. Um, yes, we've got Mimi in the front. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, my name is Mimi Turner. I work in, I guess, marketing strategy. Um, I wonder if there's an issue about the BBC's, the fundamental nature of the BBC's brand. I hear a lot about brand validated by multiple points of consumption, uh, lots of use, um, but but maybe there's a case to separate those two. I mean, consumption isn't the proof of brand. I don't consume an Aston Martin, for example, tragically, but I understand what that brand mm. stands for. And I sometimes feel that in the current argument, the BBC doesn't make the case that its brand is always there for everybody all the time. Um, a 16-year-old might cool. understand that even Good if they question. don't receive it. Yeah. And I, so I, I wonder whether brand is a, a thing that you've that's a really interesting issue. It's a kind of the library point. You might not consume it, but you, you, you're, you're glad it's there. But you see, um, we, we could take that view. Um, I, I think that would be wholly complacent, and it's not one I believe in, and it's not one uh, thing I, I've uh, uh, been a party to in my time uh, uh, as Director General. Um, I, I think uh, the great thing about a license fee paid for everybody is that you have to be universal. And what we say universal, what that means is you've got to give something to everybody. I think that is a fantastic creative challenge. Because that means it's just not good enough if you have people who are saying, well, I'm glad you're there, but we don't, I don't really use you, but I'm sort of glad. I, I, I think I want, what I, I, I hope we are developing and can continue to develop is a much warmer relationship with the British public, which is less the um, auntie of two or three decades ago, and much more something which is interwoven into the fabric of all our lives. And when you look at the number of hours that people spend with us, on average, per week, you see that we are there in people's lives. Yes, as every linear broadcaster is finding out, that's declining. The challenge that I've been facing and, and, and responding to, and will continue to respond to, is to make sure that we're there uh, in people's lives, and that continues. And, and I think the value that people can drive from the BBC is it relates very directly to the amount of time they consume, they consume us. So I, I think we've got to be more positive than maybe uh, the implication of your question. Final question from the front here. Can I mic to the front, please, quickly? Um, Ed Shade from Deloitte. This is a, a purely personal question, really. Uh, hopefully not inappropriate, of course. But what's your most sort of successful or serendipitous failure? My most ser seren serendipitous failure. So what's the, you know, I, I suppose it, it came to my mind when you were talking about the decision around BBC Three. What, what, are, what are the things that you've done that at the time you didn't think were brilliant, but actually it turned out to be rather fantastic? God, that's a fantastic question. And, and you know, I have no idea what the uh, answer is. I love the idea of serendipity um, because um, if I can just kind of slightly riff on that, uh, the thing which I think about the best organisations is the bumping into people from a different background, from a different genre, that maybe then sets off something where, you know, it wouldn't otherwise have happened. And, you know, if you think about where drama is at the moment, there's a really rich vein of drama meeting comedy, uh, which is said if you, if you just have everything in in silos, you don't get that. So I, I, I think that's, um, th that, that I enjoy. But what, what's, I, 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 I can't, can't answer your question, I'm sorry, but, but, but thank you for it. Well, Tony, we've, we're, it's been a real privilege this morning to be reminded of your, uh, your passion, your vision, your energy, and your commitment to this, this incredibly important public institution over, over so many uh, decades, and more recently as, as its leader. Uh, thank you so much. Please uh, join me in thanking Lord Hall.